Welcome back. Uh, I hope that you had a bit, you know, time to to chat and relax and decompress before the last panel. Uh, well, it's a great pleasure to to start this last panel uh, with Muntadas being moderator, um, and it's been really it's been really great uh, to have all of you people. Uh, during these uh, two days here and uh, and being so focused and uh, uh, and contributing uh, contributing to the space as Muntadas uh, through his work and uh, and his practice and his methodology you know described as space of generosity and several of us we were referring to that generosity and that sharing space um, it's been a uh, great pleasure to work with Muntadas during this, uh, this semester and, uh, um, and uh, also uh, now recently in the, in the, you know, during the field trip to Qatar and Kuwait. Um, and actually, you know, I was swimming in the, in the swimming pool, you know, every morning in, in, in Qatar kind of like inspired me, you know, to to kind of like pull out, you know, that research, you know. I actually wanted to speak about something else, Montadas, you know, but um, about the colonization of Mars, and I was... You are, what a project. Yeah, well, but, but thanks to you, and, uh, and certainly, uh, certainly your, uh, your uh, ideas, uh, you know, that bring into the game, uh, into the artistic practice, archival methodology and archival, you know, thinking, Think of uh, of artists engaging archives. Uh, this being important uh, to uh, my generation you know, and uh, and uh, and uh, our students and other artists. So, and as we have uh, CVS archives, as uh, as Uta mentioned also uh, in her talk, uh, it is important also for us to uh, to think. Uh, uh, about the concept of you know what makes that archive uh, as living. Uh, so, well, uh, let me follow the protocol. Protocols, uh, uh, as you know, is also a very important part of Montada's methodology. So, as we very often, you know, referring to this, during these two days to Montada's, and uh, so uh, protocols are important. So, let me follow the protocol and introduce Montada's once again. Anthony Muntades, an artist and educator, was born in Barcelona in 1942 and has lived in New York since 1971. Muntades came to MIT in 1977 to join the Center for Advanced Visual Studies, CAVS, as a research fellow. In this experimental setting, he explored topics such as the media landscape and the dichotomies between subjectivity and objectivity, and private and public. He works on projects in different media, such as photography, video, publications, the World Wide Web, public intervention, and multimedia installations. Since 1995, Muntades has grouped together a set of works and project titled on translation. Their content, dimensions, and materials are highly diverse, and they all focus on the author's personal experience and artistic activity in numerous countries over a period of 30 years. By grouping such works together under the, this epigraph, Muntades places them within a body of experience and concrete concerns regarding communication, the culture of our times, and the role of the artist and art in contemporary society. He is currently professor of the practice at ACT in the Department of Architecture at MIT and at the Institutio Universitario di Architectura del Veneto in Venice. And uh, for me, uh, his project on translation, which I encountered in 1995 during the Aris Helsinki exhibition, uh, that uh, uh, before we got to know each other, but me, Muntades, and Krzysztof uh, were part of that exhibition. Um, for me, that project uh, that Muntades did uh, in Esplanade in Helsinki that was looking into translation of the uh, Helsinki peace conferences and finding these glitches you know, between the people that trying to negotiate the peace, but actually because of translations, uh, this project very often you know, fails. 
um, for me, uh, for me, that point was very important. Also, as someone you know who comes uh, to a different cultural context, and uh, and very often also we talk with Krzysztof, you know, and and other colleagues that this constant need of translating yourself, you know, uh, and this is one of the important uh, probably destinations of, of artistic practice. So thank you, Montados, and please, I want to hand over you. Thank you. Okay, Guilherminas, uh, two panels. I hope you are getting paid double, no? <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, I think uh, I got to uh, introduce myself in relation with MIT. When I arrived in 77, MIT, uh, Otto Pini invited me, and immediately I know people like Georgie Kippes, and I think he was very important mentor. And working, and I say yesterday, with other people like Aldo Tamberini, Mark Mendel, John Brigham, a group of people that really was inspiring and interesting. And uh, at that time, we worked in a space that it was in front of the main building. When I left, and when I come back, this place, it becomes the center for religions. Like that, uh, it was already talking about the space. It was uh, my studio, it was the Buddhist section. <laughs> then, when I uh, come back for second times, because Life at MIT was an editing, uh, at Visual Arts program, uh, it was an industrial space uh, in Mass Avenue, 265 Mass Ave. And I left and this place becomes an architecture department of the design and uh, anyway, another life. And the third is the Media Lab. Like that, three programs, three spaces, very different. Um, of course, whatever you do in the spaces, you are conditioned for that. Um, for the presentation of the panel, I would like to mention that the title is uh, Public Space Research Projects and Production. And basically, it has to do with the idea of, in a way, methodology, methodology of the project and I think it has a resonance with the exhibition downstairs. The exhibition downstairs, I will say, then is a, a, an effort with uh, Nomedas and the group of people, then also Guilherminas, uh, Atra being command. And it's a lot of people that already, I think, Guilherminas give credit. And um, it's basically, it's a recopilation of projects of through the class of uh, the seminar on, on, on public space. Different years, uh, different contexts, different discussions, different people. And I think the, the recopilation of the work is a, a, a sample of what a lot of projects have been made that are not there. I think it was, uh, a decision that it was not a curatorial decision. It was just to have some samples of different kind of works. I will say then that these uh, words that are in the exhibition appear and resonate in the space is uh, kind of questions that I myself uh, question I made for myself for my own projects. Like that, I think is a series of questions that everybody should uh, answer when is working in a project. I don't want it to be dogmatic. It's, a, it's part of my own ways of thinking, but sometimes this is, some, uh, is also could be helpful for other people. And in a way, uh, decide, for example, then how it comes not in the beginning 
the medium becomes very late when a lot of decisions of the what and the why is answered. And obviously they were and when the specificity of the time or the specificity of space, actually specificity of time, people don't talk, but I think it's very important. Um, for who, the audience, the public, and finally, the money. And I think it's important to do very little, with very little money to do as much as possible. I think low cost and possibilities of projects to, and related to that, I wanted to say one of the trips when uh, Jennifer was uh, the TA, we decided to do the case study in Las Vegas. And I think it's connected uh, how much. We think that maybe go to the casino, we could get some solutions for production. <laughs> and actually, too, they win. <laughs> I think it was a little bit of discussion in the beginning that say, well, a cast of public car go to Las Vegas? Las Vegas is an interesting city. Anyway, the, I wanted to, to introduce a little bit, the, very briefly, the people they got to talk about their work. And I think it's, I will say it's a kind of four case studies. Each one is very different practice. Uh, the work of Matthew Mazzotta, uh, he was graduate here at the ACT program, and uh, he's been doing uh, a series of projects in public space that I think they are very, very relevant in the times we live, this relationship, what I would say, with the, the way, and for me, it represents a combination of the traditional artists with the contemporary artists, a fusion. Some people who use his hand, and he designed the work, but he works with the community, and he, he brings the result a very contemporary uh, work. He has been awarded for his last project, Open House, and I think it's, uh, he will talk about that. Um, the second to talk is uh, Marika Trotter, and in the classes in public art, we always wanted to have somebody from Harvard because I think it's a, ca a case study too. <laughs> I think uh, I like it to have somebody from Harvard and an undergraduate because this is uh, two things. And the, I feel like the students of Harvard, they are always very good in the first part of the course. Great research, good ideas, conceptualization. But when he arrived, the moment of doing, boom. <laughs> they are really, they are so proud of themselves, sorry, <laughs> that they then deliver. They don't deliver. They are, you know, and I think it's, uh, it's interesting because for the Harvard students, I think they learn from the second part for the MIT students. And uh, in the case of Marika, I, I think it's a strange case because she's a doer too. She is a good researcher, a theorist, and he's doing the PhD now in Harvard. And he was very, very involved with the project from the beginning of the end. Case study of Harvard student. <laughs> anyway, but reverse. <laughs> and I will say that the third person, Corin Kempster, I think it's an example of uh, somebody that I think is an artist, but becomes an architect. And I remember I have this book you made, you know, that looks like the red book of Mao. And this is a, a fabulous artist book. And uh, now it's working, it was working at Elsa Glimeron in uh, Basel, then it's now in studio in design in, uh, between Basel and that, but going back to Toronto. Anyway, uh, I think, again, another case study. <laughs> uh, the fourth case study is uh, Jennifer Alora, where I think is, a, a, I will say, the anthropophagical uh, the of books and information. 
an incredible researcher. And I think with the partner, Guillermo Calzadilla, they do a duo that I think the collaboration, this aspect so difficult, arrives to us very high limits. I think uh, the research of uh, Jennifer, I always feel like it was exceptional. And I think you see in your work. Um, I would say then uh, that's it. I think I pass the word to Matthew. Before I go to introduce Asra, uh, I have a problem, problem to pronounce the word. Asra Aksamaya, sorry. Uh, we, it seems like this, this symposium of accents here. <laughs> you know, it's the Italian, the Lithuanian, German, uh, on and on and on. Well, Spanish, <laughs> uh, Catalan. Um, Astra is uh, my neighbor in the studio, <laughs> colleague, and she graduated, well, she do the PhD here in the Aga Khan program in TCC, and uh, now is teaching in, in the program. And as I say, I promise I don't go to be a very uh, um, formal presentation. And the last one is Beatriz Colomina, that I have a, a close uh, respect and friendship is an uh, architecto historian, theorist, and she has uh, the fantastic ability to put things together, you know? Architecture, feminism, seduction, modernity, the architecture magazines, and finally Playboy, like that. I don't say much. I think you respond to all these things by yourself. She will be both the respondents, but also with a little bit more than respondent. In the case of uh, Beatriz, I think it will be uh, introduction to certain kind of uh, issues. Anyway, uh, thank you. And uh, Matthew. Thank you. Put this up here. Sorry. It's all okay. I'll just use it that way. Um, yeah, my name is Matthew Mazzotta, and I'm an artist that works in public space. Um, I was also a student of Mutatis. Okay. Um, I would like to show you a project I did called Open House, and then um, kind of inside my brain on how I think about putting work in public spaces. I'm going to show a video, it's about five or six minutes long. Willie Cook. Open House is a unique event space. It is a collaboration with the people of York, Alabama to transform a blighted property in York's downtown into a new public art project that has the shape of a house but can physically transform into a 100-seat open-air theater free for the public. In January 2011, artist Matthew Mazzara was invited by the Coleman Center for the Arts to organize an artwork with the people of York, Alabama. The Coleman Center is a contemporary arts organization that uses art to foster positive social change and has been bringing creativity and support to the people of York since its founding in 1985. During his initial visit to York, the artist asked people from the community to bring something from their living rooms so that they could recreate a living room outdoors in the middle of the street as a way to provoke discussion 
about what were on people's minds and to generate ideas about what direction they might go in. From the discussions in this outdoor living room, they identified that York really had a lack of public spaces that are truly open to everyone, and as they listened to each other's stories and experiences of York, this became a common thread. They also identified that the many abandoned houses all over the downtown have been bringing down the look and feel of York for years. From this conversation, they developed a project that uses the materials of an abandoned house, as well as the land it sits on, to build a smaller house on the footprint of the old house. However, this new house has a secret. It physically transforms from the shape of a house into an open-air theater that sees 100 people by having its walls and roof fold down. It's called Open House. Open House lives mostly in the form of a house between the main grocery store and the post office, reminding people what was there before. But it opens up when the community wants to enjoy shows, plays, movies, and any other event people can think of that supports community life in York. And when the theater is folded back up into the shape of a house, the property is a public park for anyone to enjoy. In the summer of 2012, Matthew and his team began creating models of the folding structure and organized the dismantling of the abandoned house. They gathered as much of the usable materials as possible from the abandoned house before the fire department and the city did a controlled burn of the house and cleared the property of the remaining debris. They began building the structure of open house by marrying new materials with materials gathered from the abandoned house as well as railroad track ties from the town's train yard. A year later, the people of York and the surrounding areas joined for the inauguration of Open House, which included a ribbon cutting by the mayor, an invocation prayer to bless the space by a local minister, gospel singers, music from the local R&B band Time Zone, and a screening of Dr. Zeus's The Lorax. Totally Happy birthday. Okay. Open House directly addresses the lack of public space in York, Alabama. By using the concept of transformation to turn an abandoned building into a new community space, it provides opportunities for people to come together for years to come. I had uh, some friends of mine come down as well, and Jagan, Vincent, DePaul, who graduated from this program, and my friend Corey and Curtis as well. Um, so let's go. Um, the story starts with the Coleman Center, which is an arts organization that's been in York, Alabama for 30 years, and um, a woman named Tut started it. Has different directors, but these two directors now, Nathan Purath and Shanna Berger, um, are looking for artists that are more of a social practice. Anyways, they were at a conference and they bumped into Uda. Uda su suggested, hey, maybe work with Matthew. So um, I had this, they said, you can come down. Actually, they'll pay me for everything. Uh, fly me down, give me some money. I said, what do you want me to do? do give a talk? They said, no, just hang out with the community. I said, okay. Um, so then we started thinking about intervention. And when I was younger, I had, was in art school in Chicago. And uh, I used to have a van. I used to bring all my friends with me. We'd get in that van and listen to punk rock tapes or classical or Joseph Campbell and have conversations about philosophy or whatever. But we would pick up things from the alley, you know, 
TVs and rugs and fake plants and all these things. And we would put them in public parks. And there was something about that that was so magical. I think there's something that I really enjoy about having domestic items in public space. And I also think about, um, you know, there's a private side of us and a public side of us. And, and kind of, you know, I really enjoy trying to get this private part of us in public space as much as possible. Um, so this conversation starts trying to provoke some new kind of dialogue. And um, I guess the first thing I do, I say, I'm an artist. I can work. Um, let's write some grants. Let's do some things. What do you want to do? And, you know, in a conversation like this, no one knows anything. So make a painting because they don't know me. So I said, well, I, I like to build things. Can we go with the conversation in a couple different ways? So I asked um, people, I said, well, um, where do you guys hang out? on the weekends, and somebody said, I hang out in my church, and someone said, I hang out in my church. So then I was asking, I heard some people talking about fishing, and I said, where do you guys go fishing? And everybody was very quiet, because no one wants to reveal their secret fishing spot. <laughs> so I was like, okay, where's the spot where everybody comes together to hang out? And they actually didn't have one in this town, so that became an obvious thread. Let's, let's get a public place started. Second thing was someone offered me a church. They said, do you want a church? I said, yes. And then uh, they said, do you really want a church? I said, oh, sure. And they said, well, you're going to have to start paying taxes on it. I said, OK, I don't want the church. But it made me think that why is real estate so cheap here? And then I started seeing all the abandoned buildings. And I was like, OK, that's the resource. So let's make a public space out of um, an abandoned house. This abandoned house was owned by three ladies who want to start a nursery. This is actually, even though it doesn't look like it, it's kind of in the center of town. Um, the post office here, I'm standing on the roof of the grocery store. All these parking lots are around us. Um, so we went into this house, took it apart. They started trying to paint it up to make it look good for the nursery, which never came. That's James who helps me in the beginning rip it apart. We took as many usable materials as possible. Then uh, the city helped us. They got involved in destroying the rest of the material, which wasn't my thought on how you do that, but that's how they do it down there. Um, so we were part of this, as James there, he was a very wise guy, um, interesting to hang out with. Um, so open house. So we built this thing and had an opening, and I just remember thinking that, you know, public space is actually political. This is a place where people can sit together and dream together about their community. And if there isn't a space for this, this dialogue doesn't go on. So for me, it was a big deal to make a space where people could look out from a vantage point and say, OK, what else can we think about our city? How, what, how are these conversations even existing without this public space? Um, so people would ask me, so what are we going to do with the rest of the, pub, uh, the abandoned houses? And you know, that wasn't a question I could answer, but I like that they brought that to me. So people ask me, what happens with Open House now after the opening? So I wouldn't even start a project like this unless I knew that there was an, like an organization that would take it forward. Um, so the Coleman Center has done this. They said, we're going to program the site. We'll be the, the chaperones of this project. And they keep on doing events. This was just one event that happened in the fall. Um, I like this because it's Andy Warhol eats a hamburger. So they were showing different films, but then they showed some art films, too, to this community. I thought to myself, you know, when I was young, I grew up in a small town, and there was no culture. There was a culture of our small town, but I didn't know any of this type of culture. And so our art teacher showed us Andy Warhol and the warehouse. And that was the first time I saw adults taking resources and just going crazy, like videotaping each other until they cry or sleeping or, you know, tinfoil on the wall, Velvet Underground playing, Nico's doing her thing. I was like, this is, to me, this is where I'm going to be with my life. So this was just nice um, <laughs> that Andy Warhol was part of this as well. I, I email, I'm on Facebook with uh, the mayor of York, so I emailed her. I said, did you ever do, because she talked about doing a, um, a city a hall meeting, you know? And she says, yeah, on the 19th of next month, they're going to do a meeting in the town. So for me, it's actually changing the culture of that town. Um, there's going to be you know, different conversations because of this art project, so I'm happy. OK, now I'm switching to kind of uh, my thoughts on public art. Um, about three years ago, I was commissioned to do a permanent work here in Cambridge um, as a 1% for art project. And I thought, OK, permanent, huh? I do a lot of temporary things. Temporary, you can be wild. 
You can be crazy, you can be poignant, you can be contemporary, you can be all these things because you know it's gonna go. But what can exist in the public space in the future that's gonna be relevant to those communities? I was really stuck. So can permanent public art be critical is what I was thinking. How do I do this? Can a community live with this level of criticality every day? Can a you know, community be challenged every day by a piece of work or does it just lose its effect or become annoying? Um, how do we make artwork that provides critique for the present moment that will also be relevant in 30 plus years when we know that the meaning of everything changes and evolves? I think I was thinking about, actually when we were down in Brazil, uh, I think I saw a sculpture that was a rainbow and it was talking about peace and I was like, wow, we don't talk about peace with rainbows anymore. And the rainbow actually means something else. And so a lot of things for me when I thought about how am I gonna put something in public that will have any relevancy in 30 plus years because that was the, what I had to accomplish. Anyways, I just found this cartoon that I thought was funny. It's a diagram and then at the bottom it says, as the meaning of words shift and multiply based upon context and in relation to other words, the placement of some concepts within fig two may appear contradictory, redundant, or debatable. So it's just the idea that things will change over time. So how do I think about putting something into public space that I don't know how it's gonna be related to later. Anyways, I went to um, Biella, Italy, and was part of uh, Michelangelo Pistoletto's um, residency, Chitta dell'arte. I wanted to do an intervention there, and I walked into this nice plaza. There was all these bricks, and you know, well done. All the buildings around it were there. And then in the middle was a fountain, and I always wanted to use the water, but there was actually a pedestal and then this saint there. And so I, I thought that that would be relevant to my work since I wanted to do the intervention right there. So I asked people, what is this saint? And people said, I don't know who that is. And then someone else gave me a name, someone else gave me a different name. And so it makes me think of Kristoff. He said this one time in class. He said, um, sometimes things in public become invisible. And I think that was another thing I was thinking about. And I think I'm gonna try to quote Godominus. He says, uh, in the old country, sometimes the uh, the temporary is the only thing that's permanent. And I think this is the idea that if something's put up permanently, it will also be taken down for the same reasons, where some guy's cooking fish on the side, that might exist for generations and generations. It's just interesting ways to think about what exists. So I thought about permanent, okay, I thought about art in public. The temporary, which we talked about, or I talked about, <laughs> um, can be many things, but we know it's gonna leave. So it could be an Occupy, it could be a KKK rally, it can be something about the environment, it can be many things because we know it's not gonna exist much longer. Permanent, as we know, that has to go into the future and it's set in that way. And then system, that's the thing I'm kind of thinking about now. And this is kind of, um, let's talk about uh, Project Row House with, um, who's that guy, Rick Lowe. Hold on one second. Uh, in Houston, Texas, he sets up this string of houses and invites community artists to come into it. And the reason that's always gonna be relevant to that community, and maybe it does hit a bubble at one point, but is because it can refresh itself. It always can bring in new artists, a new direction. And, and an institution like this, an organization like a university can do the same thing. It's a permanent gesture, yet it refreshes itself by direction, bringing in people that will facilitate that. So I started thinking about that. Open House is a platform to, to show local talent to itself in that town, but also a hub to bring in outside talent and movies and whatever, but it always can remain um, in relationship to the wants and desires of that community because it was programmed by them. So that was system. Oh man, uh, <laughs> my friend Jagan says, if anybody ever shows you a Venn diagram, be skeptical. <laughs> Anyways, this is my first one I ever drew, but this is how I think about public art. Um, there are many um, types of knowledge in this world um, and people perceive the world in different ways. Um, I thought that if I want to put a, a piece of work in public, you know, it might not be an art informed person that looks at that. So I want to involve, you know, an entry point for many different people. So I broke it up into experiential, mass media, and academic. Experiential is kind of, you know, the little kid is holding the ice cube and he's watching the little drip with the sunlight coming in and the prism. 
The kid could be in Florida or it can be an Inuit up in the great north. It doesn't matter. That's a relationship they have with the world. It's watching the water come down the driveway or pulling the little rock out of the river and letting the water go through. That knowledge is gained by experience. Um, mass media, mass culture. This is what's in um, the dentist's office, the magazines. This is Malaysia flight whatever. This is green architecture. This is Occupy. This is... Katrina, this is all the stuff that will end up in jeopardy in conversations. This is where wars are kind of, you know, it, it holds us in conversations and it can be directed and manipulated as we, many people spoke about. But there is that type of knowledge too. And then the academic, and this is a foolish place for me to talk about this because I'm not an academic, but I think about academia as um, putting things in a historical context. So Occupy, wow, it's the most important thing in the world. But then when you place it in context of other, you know, movements or protests in the street and the civil rights movement or whatever, it can kind of place it in context and understand what it is a little bit differently. Science has a discourse, art has a discourse, and at the end of that discourse is a conversation. And it's interesting to know it and try to add to that conversation. So I want to have work that's in public be able to be interesting for these three types of knowledge. This is something that... Uh, Muntada said, I don't know if we're supposed to quote you, and I don't know if this is a quote because I just think I heard it. Um, <laughs> we're talking about artwork, and uh, it said, uh, one point of entry, many interpretations. I think we're talking about somebody's work, and it was getting too abstracted, and we couldn't find the one point of entry. So I think about work like that a lot. You know, let's say Christoph does a work about war. I don't, I've never been to war. Someone else might have been to war. But we both go in through the same door, and I relate my experiences that let's say Christoph with war, has put together for me, and I'm able to you know, advance myself through this kind of platform he's put where someone else that might have been through war has the same similar experience of gaining knowledge, but they're relating all their experiences, which are different from mine. One point of entry, many interpretations. Finally, I'll end it like this. I think about my work as, um, <laughs> as fruit, and uh, <laughs> I know, <laughs> kind of funny to say it like this. Anyways, um, Fruit is, you know, it's, um, it's colorful, it's appealing, it smells good, it's shiny. It's basically asking the animal to come for it. And, but f fruit is not, you know, grown just for that. Fruit is for the seeds and is about dissemination of ideas. So a lot of my work is about whimsy, about humor, about spectacle. It's about bringing people into a situation so that they can have some kind of dialogue or some kind of experience, and then they will leave with that experience. So... That's kind of how I think about my work. Thank you. Right. <clears throat> so this is going to be a very different kind of talk. I'm a PhD candidate, so I'm doing history. Um, yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm a, I'm, apparently I'm also a case study, which is good to know. Um, I, I wanted to talk to you today about the persistent representational aspect of urban space. And, uh, and to suggest that this dimension complicates received notions of the space of public life and interest that Hannah Arendt called uh, the space of appearance. So, Lisbon, 1755, November 1st, a little after 9.40 in the morning. A 10 minute three pulse earthquake of approximately 9.0 on the Richter scale to use contemporary units of measure hits off the Iberian Peninsula. November 1st is All Saints Day, and 9.40 a.m. finds most of that city as Catholic citizenry celebrating Mass. 35 of Lisbon's 40 churches collapse onto their congregations. The downtown is leveled when the alluvial fill on which it has been built liquefies. The earthquake triggers a series of three tsunamis which push up the Tagus estuary and engulf the city. And candles lit for the holy day overturn 
and ignite a fire that burns for five days. Over a third of the city is destroyed. Of about 150,000 inhabitants of Lisbon at that time, about 10,000 are killed outright, and about 40 to 50,000 are grievously injured. Obviously, a disaster of epic proportions. Now, Lisbon, the Lisbon that was thus decimated, was for the most part a medieval warren where roads were often little less than cow paths, little more than cow paths, and rickety buildings uh, strained upward towards fugitive air and sunlight. This uncomely fabric was punctuated here and there with ceremonial open spaces used for courtly and ecclesiastical rituals, such as here at the Trier du Possu on the waterfront, or here at the Rocio, where the gallows, the market stalls, the fountains, the churches, all provide the stock elements for what Jürgen Habermas would call representative publicity, that precursor to real public, the real public sphere. In 1755 Lisbon, this space of ritual and display extended to the public autos de fe, in which counter-reformation Portugal enthusiastically burned its heretics, even as other Catholic nations, such as Spain, were winding down their inquisitions. This space of sometimes violent ritual and display was the capital of King Joao V, who implemented a wholesale renaissance in Lisboan architecture and fine arts from coffers enriched by Brazilian gold and diamonds. The elaborately Italianate Baroque style he favored, and these examples are from the north of Lisbon, uh, where several buildings survived the earthquake, was crammed indiscriminately into the urban fabric to represent Joao V's assumed mantle of the new Solomon. Here, for example, is his chapel of St. John the Baptist, which survived the earthquake and is probably the most expensive chapel ever built in the world. Toward the end of his reign, the king took an interest in the, quote, greater comfort, symmetry, and decoration of the city, end quote, as if Lisbon was one large royal apartment that could use new decor. That's my baby over there, my sweetheart. <laughs> he commissioned the Italian architect, Filippo Uvara, to design a better stage for, as the king put it, an image of the celestial court on earth. Yet, while Uvara's celestial stage set ultimately went unrealized, Joao V was persuaded to take an interest in a pressing infrastructural issue, Lisbon's serious lack of drinking water. Note the middle ground of this painting of the Trier du Passu. A fight has broken out over spilled water from a crowded fountain. In fact, the entire city of Lisbon before 1755 was served by only four fountains, two in the old Alfama district here and here, the other in the Rocio, and the last in the Trier du Passu, as you just saw. In a region with chronically low rainfall, little to no subsurface water, and a general soil pollution from innumerable private septic tanks, fights, long lines, dry fountains, and riots were a daily occurrence. Now, actually, there had been plans to augment the city's water with a more plentiful supply transported by gravity as early as the 16th century. Here is a drawing proposing a monumental ornamented fountain as part of this plan. And notice the little fountain on top of the larger edifice this will come back as a motif later on, called the Aguas Livres, or the Free Waters. The project was finally successfully pitched to the king, and it happened to be Joao V, uh, as a kind of ultimate territorial embellishment that would be lit by, quote, and this seems to be the phrase that did it, the brilliant torch of charity, without which all the other works, no matter how sublime they may be, remain in the dark. That the project had a, had a primarily aesthetic, representational impetus is obvious in its final route, which includes a massively expensive and logistically completely unnecessary monumental arched span across the Alcantara Valley into Lisbon. This is an alteration to the original design, 
which greatly slowed the project's completion and increased the tax burden on Lisboans. Thus, the stunning and simple pointed arches that are rightly considered a monument to 18th century engineering today are in fact as ornamental as that lavish interior of the chapel of St. John the Baptist. Now, think of the Lisbon earthquake as a shake of the cosmic kaleidoscope, a literal tossing of the existing elements into a new pattern in which what was once ground becomes figure, and what was once figure becomes ground. And I like this particular German engraving because one can actually see the ornament of Joao V's Lisbon of appearances literally popping off an urban environment confronting the reality of planetary caprice. And the caption reads, in 10 minutes, the largest churches and handsomest buildings were transformed into stone heaps. The ornament that used to function as a celestial liaison is now revealed to be subject to the gravity and erosion of the planet. It has fallen to Earth and become part of it. And the city, the city has ceased to be a stage at all and has become something more like a ship, a fragile heterotopia adrift on a liquid substrate. And it is not incidental that shipbuilding techniques were used to prefabricate and assemble the new urbanism of Portugal after 1755. If we look at the sequence of plans produced for the rebuilding of Lisbon, we can actually see the kaleidoscope shift from Habermas's representative publicity to a bourgeois and commercial public sphere. First is a tentative plan to rebuild the city substantially as it was, with the churches and other ecclesiastical mon monuments outlined here in red, preserved in place. Then the imposition of a grid to honor these sacred sites, it's twisted, and the city's existing topography is also respected. Next, the grid is straightened and aligned with the cardinal points. The churches are shifted into analogous positions. And finally, we see the ultimate solution, to impose a completely regularized grid overtop the old landscape without respect for the location of things secular, spiritual, or royal. The city center has in fact been evacuated of all royal and religious program in order to make way for a unified bourgeois entity that is meaningful in its own right. Now add to this a limit on architectural ornament, that paramount substance of appearances such that facades that had before the earthquake been designed like this, this is from 1754, the year before the earthquake, were now being designed like this, and this, and this. And what I love about these uh, carefully drawn and actually very large scale elevations is their careful depiction of blank space. Add to that, insofar as we know, the first urban section to integrate the ground, the infrastructural isolation of public pedestrian space, you can see it's carefully bollarded off, uh, bracketed, if you will, from the flows of air, sunlight, sewage, and carriages now managed as part of the modern city. And it begins to be possible to ascertain the clearance of Hannah Arendt's space of public appearance amidst the wreckage of the old and ornamented city of seeming. And yet ornament did not disappear from the new Lisbon altogether. The Aguish Leverish Aqueduct had been completed and its integration into the city fabric became part of Lisbo's, Lisbon's reconstruction. Its triumphal touchdown within the city limits was ornamented. Specifically, the new public fountains designed to distribute this salubrious infrastructure became highly ornamented nodes. And note the little stone fountains uh, on top here, they've come back as a motif. And here, and here, and here. Announcing the aqueous bounty of the modern city's public spaces. It is as if ornament, released from the ritual significance of architectural facades, becomes available for infrastructure, which is now to be valued in its own right. The only catch is that it wasn't true. 
Whether due to some flaw in the initial calculations or more likely due to the change in the aqueduct's route, these fountains trickled rather than gushed about one-fifth of their expected volume. The renderings which in each case celebrated the plentiful water supplies of modern Lisbon, you can see here the, the gushing, that's part of the renderings, were as bound up with seeming as the stone fountains that crowned each design. And one can see actually that this was an embarrassment. These illusory significations were removed from the built iterations of these fountains and replaced by more ambiguous monuments. To conclude, I want to suggest that this elusive space of appearance that we call public space remains inflected by ornamental and surficial appearances, which may or may not correspond to real conditions. And this is in spite of any easy divisions between pre-modern and modern space, such as Habermas may wish us to believe, and that this is not a bad thing. Such seemings are powerful prompts of expectations and actions. They fall within the purview of art practices and effects. In a symposium like this one, it is perhaps redundant to remind us that such seemings possess the potential to infect public space with utopian alternatives to the status quo. But perhaps the case of Lisbon before and after 1755 can remind us that sometimes this very redundancy, this excess, this representation, can pack a challenge of its own. Thank you. Hi. Uh, <clears throat> I first want to say a big Thank you to Gediminas and Mantadis for inviting me. It's truly a really great privilege to take part in this event. Um, during the break, I was trying to explain to a friend um, the impact that Mantadis had on my education here at MIT. And I, I remembered something that I, I wanted to share with you. So Mantadis's class was required of all MARC students, first semester, first year. And Mentatus, of course, began by completely freaking everybody out. None of us could believe that the informal atmosphere that he set in his class could really be a forum for serious learning. We had come to MIT, and we weren't expecting to sit around in a circle chatting. Of course, over the course of the semester, it became more than apparent that in fact informal discussions were the very best setting to discuss serious topics. And what's more than that, he taught us that the discussion didn't have to come to an end when we left the class. And I really want to thank you for that. So today, <clears throat> I'm going to present a museum that Harry Guger Studio has designed. Uh, that's the firm where I work currently uh, for Guatemala City. And given the theme of the symposium, of course, I'm going to talk mostly about the public spaces that we designed. Uh, I'm going to also include some of the politics that have gone on behind trying to implement those public spaces. And as I talk, I'm also going to bring in three other museum projects that I've been fortunate enough to work on to help flesh out the discussion. The Museo Maya de America is a private foundation in Guatemala City that works to repatriate Maya artifacts that have been plundered over the centuries. They're building a museum to showcase their collection together with that of their founder, Fernando Paez, and hopefully uh, the national collection as well. We've finished concept design now, and the client is hoping to start construction sometime next year. The project is a collaboration with Boston Architects Over Under, who some of you are probably familiar with. Of course, the Maya left behind not only artifacts, they also left us this incredibly rich uh, history of, of intricate monuments. And we were really determined to be inspired by these, but we wanted to resist quoting them too directly. 
Our response was to design a building that presents a large, almost scaleless, abstract form to the city. The site where the museum is is very special. It's located next to other cultural institutions, but uh, the great thing is it's right on the edge of what is set to become Guatemala City's answer to Central Park. And right now we're negotiating with the city. We're pushing very hard to have the street that currently separates the site from the park removed. And the reason for that is we want the experience of the museum to be a seamless extension of the public space of that park. The building consists of two elements. On the ground level, there's a massive outdoor covered space that we call the public plinth. And above that hovers the museum box. The plinth is completely accessible and you can approach it from three sides. Uh, on the plinth you find most of the supporting functions for the museum, uh, the sort of supplemental public programs, an auditorium, amphitheater, ticketing and info, children's workshops, a cafe, and of course the gift shop. Ironically, uh, today the site actually is the host for a, uh, a crafts market for Maya people. So at the very beginning, we tried really, really hard to convince the client that he should keep these people on the site and simply incorporate them uh, and the market into the public plinth. And that worked for a long time, uh, but ultimately, <laughs> he feared the operational complications of hosting uh, a network of small-scale retailers. But to his credit, um, what he did then was he lobbied the city to find them a new site just across the road. And then he supported us when we suggested that we should build a pedestrian bridge uh, because the road is much too busy to be crossed at grade uh, so that the museum and the market could be permanently connected. And uh, the client, I should say, is very eager to have the building work as a connector to all of the neighboring functions in this way. Uh, he's oversizing the underground parking garage uh, by quite a dramatic amount because he wants people who visit the park to learn to use the museum as the base for their trip. And that pedestrian bridge which connects the museum uh, to the market also connects it to the zoo to the north. And so the museum will become a very important shortcut in the city for people moving from the zoo to the park and, and vice versa. All of this, of course, is, is super good news for us because all of this uh, additional pedestrian movement is what's going to ensure that the public plinth we're planning remains a truly activated and lively public space. This experience contrasts quite sharply with another that we had in planning a museum for the Indian city of Kolkata. There too we pushed to have this hyper public ground plane and we had a lot of help from the program. The client wanted a lot of additional program uh, <clears throat> there were cafes, restaurants, a covered food market planned. Um, there were workshops for craftspeople, stores for them to sell uh, what they made in them. There was a massive amphitheater, um, artists in residencies, and even a boutique hotel. So what we did was we tried to plan the site as a fragment of urban life, complete with streets, storefronts, squares, things like that. And we planned this mini city for more than a year all the while with the client emphatically agreeing, until at a certain moment, it was revealed that for the client, it was perfectly clear this whole time, there would be an enormous fence around the entire site. That despite the fact that such a gesture never, never showed up on any drawing that we produced and never entered any of the discussions that we had. Unfortunately, what also went without saying was <clears throat> the nominal entrance fee that would be charged at the gate. This, the client absolutely assured us, would be really affordable by everyone. It would just be a token, a, a mere pittance. But of course, I can imagine it likely excludes something like half the population. So in Guatemala, we are really, really fortunate um, to have the opportunity to plan a truly public ground plane. The interior of the museum box also takes its cue from urban space. There we were looking at the plans of ancient Maya cities and we were informed by their structure of freestanding houses facing off across small plazas. For us, these houses became galleries and we concentrated the entrances to these galleries to face certain plazas so that we could distinguish them as sort of connector plazas from the more quiet ones tucked away in between. 
And that was to set up a situation just like a city where you have a hierarchy of space from more public to more private so that you can have a gradient of activities from louder and more interactive to more singular and contemplative. Our intention is to line the walls of these plazas with display cases. Uh, this will give them a distinctly uh, different environment from the galleries, which will be more like white box spaces. Like most museums, the MMA's collection is far too large ever to be exhibited at any one time. That leaves the majority of it tucked away, hidden from view in storage. And our idea instead is to just display all of that storage all of the time. So we'll do that loosely at first. We'll leave a lot of room in the display cases so that over time, as the collection grows, they can, they can densify the cases. This also will, of course, make sure the whole collection is accessible to the public all the time. And that means scholars and school kids alike can visit any part of the collection without prior appointment. And also, the physical condition of these works can be passively, um, passively surveyed by the staff so that if they detect physical deterioration, they can intervene much faster than if these things are just in crates in a basement somewhere. The roof of the museum is again planned as a massive public space, mirroring that of the ground plane. Our intention is for this roof to be accessible to all, a sculpture garden to be explored at the end of visiting the galleries, but also open to those who cannot afford or who choose simply to skip the galleries themselves. We also proposed an extensive roof garden in an earlier competition design we did for a museum in Lausanne. There we had the pleasure to work with the landscape architect, Gunter Focht, who many of you might know from Harvard. His concept for the plantings on this roofscape were to work with the shrubs and grasses that one finds in the foothills to the Alps. Uh, and that's because <clears throat> standing on the rooftop here in Lausanne, you can look out across Lake Geneva and see the Savoy mountain range. So this was a device for him to conceptually collapse uh, that distance between these, these two elements. Some of these shrubs turn out actually to be the tops of trees that are planted into courtyards which are scattered amongst the galleries below. The idea there is, of course, for the galleries to also profit from the landscape, both as an orientation device, but also to provide a moment of respite from the artworks. Similarly for the MMA, we want to bring nature into the building as much as possible. And what's really great is here we can do it far more literally. The climate in Guatemala is unbelievably gentle, and that, together with the robust nature of many of the artifacts on display, means that nearly the whole building can be naturally ventilated. Much of the collection can basically be exhibited in covered outdoor space. As such, we want to literally open many of the galleries up directly to the outside, through apertures in the wall, of course, and also the ceiling, but given the cantilevering nature of the museum box, we can even do it in the floor. And what we want to get to with this is we want to return to the idea that the museum is experienced as an extension of the park. And what we hope is that this will set a less formal tone in the museum, and that will make the public's interaction with the collection more accessible. We've planned the main vertical circulation through the building also as an outdoor space, connecting everything from the parking all the way up through the public plinth on the ground floor, up through the museum box, and to the roof above. For this, we were inspired by cenotes. These are sinkholes which played a very important role in Maya life, first as a source of water, but also as a spiritual space. This is their connection to the underworld. So we formed our cenote by densifying the galleries toward the center of the plan, surrounding a hole which is carved out through the museum box. Here, the public could ascend through the museum, passing the storage cabinets that I showed you along the way, catching glimpses to the exhibitions beyond that. But we also are planning specific views into the restoration studios, into the offices, into the library, because we want to give the public a sense of what has to go on behind the scenes in order for the museum to function. This is uh, not dissimilar to a competition design we later did. Uh, this time for an art storage facility for the Boymans van Bunigen Museum in Rotterdam. <coughs> in this design, <coughs> we also led visitors uh, from the ground to the roof through a series of public spaces, and the first being the lobby. The lobby 
was to be open along its entire 45 meter length directly to the loading bay. And that was to create an impression uh, for the visitor immediately upon entering uh, that they hadn't simply stepped into an extension of the museum next door, but they were in a different kind of facility, something with a more logistical uh, focus. And this also gives the possibility that uh, for a large scale event like an opening, they could in fact uh, get rid of the wall between the two and double the size of the lobby. The lobby intersects with an atrium, and that houses more views into the inner workings of the building. The bottom of the atrium is an education space where the Boymans can host events and run children's workshops, and from there, one can look directly into the art restoration studios. As one moves up through the atrium, you can catch glimpses into the Boymans art storage vaults, but also those of the private collectors who are going to provide the funding formula for the building by storing their own private collections there. The top culminates in a restaurant and a sculpture terrace, which the client specifically asked be made accessible to the public during opening hours without requiring them to buy a ticket to any of the exhibition spaces that are found along the route. And this is precisely the hope that we had for the MMA. Keeping the cenote free and accessible to the public so they could work their way up from the ground to the roof without necessarily buying a ticket would require four ticketing points two on each floor, one to either side of the cenote. The client agreed to this for a really, really long time, and ultimately he changed his mind and asked, could we include just a single ticketing point at the ground floor? We're pretty convinced that with RFID and similar technologies, uh, such a ticketing point or multiple ticketing points wouldn't even necessarily have to be staffed, and we showed him countless examples of museums around the world which uh, have <clears throat> multiple ticketing organizations even in countries with far higher labor costs, but for the moment he's steadfast. So losing the roof as a public space, because when you just have a ticket on the ground floor and the cenote then requires a ticket, this was too much for our colleagues at Over Under here in Boston, and they pushed to include a separate vertical circulation dedicated just to the public. And in fact, they had to push against us in Basel. We were still hoping to change the client's mind. And to be honest, I still feel the secondary system, it, it competes in a way with the cenote that's a bit awkward, uh, architecturally speaking. But I do want to point out it has certain advantages. It creates a loop where you can buy a ticket, visit the galleries, get to the roof. Uh, and then you can choose to descend down through the public corner. Uh, so that <clears throat> you don't have to retrace your steps, and you can repeat this in reverse because the client has agreed to a second ticketing point uh, on the roof, so you can come up through the public corner, change your mind, and decide to come back through the galleries. But I think what's really clever about Overunder's insistence on the public corner is that the route will be literally cemented in place. And as permanent infrastructure, it fares a far better chance to remain intact as public space than if, for example, we convince him to just open the cenote and once the project is complete and once our influence over the museum is finished, nothing would stop him from returning to having just one ticketing point on the ground floor. So to conclude, I just want to say that, uh, of course, it's, it's certainly the role of the architect to provide, to promote, and defend public space. Uh, some clients, like the Boymans, understand its value from the outset, and they really insist upon having it included in the design. Uh, but more often, a client needs to be convinced of the value of providing, and by providing, of course, I mean paying to provide generous public space. At times, this can be a fight, a fight against budget, of course, but also against climate, security, politics, social structures, all these issues which play roles in determining the client's willingness or even ability to be a patron of public space. And of course, we can even question just how public can these spaces be, given at the end of the day they belong to institutions and not to the public directly, especially in this case where the museum at most will be a public-private partnership. Public spaces in museums, it should be noted, simply are not the same as public spaces in the city. Both have rules of conduct. Sometimes they even have opening hours. Uh, but there is a much greater expectation of control on the part of the museum client uh, to have over their space. But more than that, there's even much more of a sense among the visitor to be controlled when they enter a public space in a museum. 
having said all that, I think it's still fair to say that museums are likely better patrons of public space than the commercial enterprises who sometimes provide them in a city like an office tower. The museum's best interests are not guided as directly by profit, and their motives are more aligned with public interaction from the outset. And while creating these spaces, like I said, takes determination on the part of the architect, what they really require is great will on the part of the client to accept them, also to promote them and ultimately to maintain them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mutaras and Geramina, for inviting me to come here today. Um, it's an honor, and um, I'm very pleased to be back here to, to talk and to be part of this wonderful homage to Muntadas and for all of the, the great ways that he has influenced my practice and that of many other artists. Um, I chose today, to, uh, in reference to the, the, the subject of this symposium, to talk about one work in particular uh, as a sort of um, way to hopefully open up some of the questions that this conference was um, seeking to address. And um, I'm going to read because I uh, I'm not uh, able to do this uh, off the cuff. So anyway, in the background, you can play the film right now. Um, it's a film that lasts 20 minutes long, and, uh, and um, its title is called Half Mast, Full Mast. And um, it's the third of a series of short films that um, I have made with my collaborator, Guillermo Calcidia, that we've been working together since 1995. Um, I came to MIT in 2001 and, and was here for um, two or three years, two years. Um, and apart from that, I, I have lived pretty much and been based in, in Puerto Rico. And so the island of Vieques um, was became part of my, my thesis project here at MIT, and it also became part of um, a body of work that Guillermo and myself have made since then. Uh, it's the third of a series of short films that we made over the course of a decade, each addressing the complicated history of Vieques, an island, municipal island of Puerto Rico that was used by the United States Navy as a bomb testing range from 1941 to, 19, to 2003 when the Navy was forced to evacuate as a result of a civil disobedience campaign waged by local residents and their supporters throughout the Americas and globally. Guillermo and myself engaged with this visual culture uh, through a long-term multi-sited project called Landmark. It was informed by the following questions. How is land differentiated from other land by the way that it is marked? Who decides what is worth preserving and what should be destroyed? What are the strategies for claiming and reclaiming marked land? And finally, how does one articulate an ethics and politics of land use? The project of Landmark encompassed a series of photographs, a sculptural conference event, an archival research publication, and three videos. Uh, returning a Sound that we made in 2003, under discussion in 2005, and most recently this film, Half Mast, Full Mast. Each of these works explore Vieques as a transitional geography, positioned precariously between the social and ecological wounds of the occupation, on the one hand, and the future-oriented project of survival, remediation, and sustainable development, on the other. At the same time, Half Mass Full Mass was produced in 2010 as a site responsive video installation for the US Pavilion at the 54th Venice Biennial, um, for which Guillermo and myself served as representative national artists. The work attempted to speak to these nationalistic underpinnings of the pavilion by highlighting certain questions of site specificity, video installation, and the cinematic. Uh, the formal questions posed by Half Mass Full Mass in turn opened onto matters of history, time, and memory in the ongoing struggle to define the future of an ecologically just post-military Vieques. As you can see uh, from this projection, though it was different in its installation form, the installation form of the, of the piece is two projectors, and it's sort of important to emphasize the material nature of the two screens being physically separated um, and not composite it together here into a single channel video as you see it. Um, but nevertheless, for this presentation, I've shown it this way. Um, in the video, we use a very simple sculptural device of a pole, which uh, as it's staked at various locations across the island, becomes a kind of site marker that in collaboration with the framing function of the camera, 
fractures the landscape in which it is situated. At the same time, the pole becomes the locus of a performative action. A young Viacense athlete enters the framed landscape, hoists his body upon the pole, leveraging his weight with that of the site marker. He holds his horizontal position for as long as he can, subjecting the otherwise rigidly rectilinear pole to a slight bending, and then ca and thus causing a misalignment from its counterpoint in the lower partition, before his muscular endurance gives way to gravity and he lets himself down to exit the scene. With the withdrawal of the figure and the realignment of the internally split pole, the cinematic scene looks the same as it had at the beginning. However, the performative event leaves a mnemonic trace. The overall bisected screens are, are invisibly marked by the memory of the now absent body and the cleaving of the poles. The micro event of this cleaving at once breaks and sustains a sense of cinematic illusion relative to the landscape. The figure ground dynamic generated by the interposition of the pole vis-a-vis -vis the landscape and the performer's gesture within it is ambivalent, at once separating and joining, dividing and connecting, partitioning and linking the multiple regions of the field at the same time. The, comp the abstract compositional logic of spacing at work in this film is articulated with reference to the cultural semiotic convention announced by the title of the film, uh, Half Mast, Full Mast, uh, which is namely the flying of a flag at half mast to mark the period of national mourning or distress. The practice originates in, the maritime, in maritime culture and was meant to mark the space at the top of a ship's mast for the invisible flag of death to be flown. In other words, it is an elementary semiotic code involving seeing what is not there, or at least visually marking the limit or place of absence that cannot in and of itself be represented. In the United States and its territories, flying a national flag or state flag at half mast can only be done with an executive mandate. In other words, an official decision must be made as to whether the death or distress in question is worthy of official recognition in the form of flag lowering. In Judith Butler's words, the lowering of a flag involves the framing and regulation of the grievability of lives, which is the condition for their viability and survival in the first place. The normal condition of a flag is, of course, that it be flown at full mast, functioning as a positive indicator of state authority and collective identification. But this normal condition is perpetually haunted by the invisible flag of death, whose place it takes, and by the vanished others who are not given the privilege of having their absence be marked. In this film, the performers of the video are put to the task of transforming their bodies into temporary, unofficial flags, hoisted from the minimal props staked out at the sites across the island. Neither tethered to the pole nor held aloft by the wind, the relation between the performer and the prop is one of physical exertion and psychological determination. The extended horizontal bodily act resists gravity until the very moment when its own singular capacity to hold itself up has been exhausted. Though dignified and concentrated, the performers are nonetheless engaged in a kind of struggle to hold on to, to hold up their position as flags relative to the sites in question, which is to say, to sustain an appearance that is otherwise precarious. The temporal duration of each performance is thus a kind of index of the singular body's ratio of weight and muscular strength, and that compounds an already complex relationship between the individual body and the collective entity that flags are normally supposed to represent. In other words, in becoming a flag, however unofficial, absurd, and precarious, the performers short circuit the typical logic of representation, which is to say the relation between the parts and the wholes of what a flag is meant to represent. As a cultural form concerned with interpolating the we of a nation state, the flag is meant to psychically bind citizens to an abstract formal design or image. Citizens project their own particular body and mind onto that site, making it coterminous with the collective body of the nation. Yet in half mast, full mast, the body literally stands in for the flag, contaminating the official place of the general unity of the people. Needless to say, this is not a real flagpole, and the ritual of raising and lowering has no proper authorization, no commanding power, no identificatory compulsion. Having failed to meet the predetermined criteria, the performance does not do what a ritual is supposed to do, that is, reproduce the status quo of a given social order and the definite distribution of roles upon which the latter depends. 
Yet what, a, what if, as Thomas Keenan has posed, something else actually does happen when those who are unauthorized to do something nevertheless simulate an official ritual and make themselves into something else by rewriting the context? Our belief is that something political still does happen in these simulated or fictional gestures, which reframe sites across the island variously in terms of celebration conquest versus mourning defeat. That the act, uh, the performers enact this unofficial ritual with their living bodies is significant in terms of the ecological and biopolitical conditions of the island. Half mass, full mass proposes that these marked sites be reframed through a biopolitical lens. Um, I'm going to skip the definition of the biopolitics, as I'm sure we all know it, by Foucault. But anyway, moving forward, um, uh, before discussing the ways uh, in which this film um, attempts to reframe the specific sites uh, in Vieques in terms of a form of individual address, I wish to also mention um, the physical setting and installation in which the video was first presented, as it seems to have been a subject that came up today in other discussions, uh, which was specifically the U.S. Pavilion at the 54th Venice Biennial. Uh, what does it mean for an artist to represent the United States at the Venice Biennial? In the most general sense, the artist is this institutional, in this institutional setting, is meant to stand for a particular exemplification of the creative capacities of a nation as a whole relative to the artistic representation of other nations. Though, of course, not under any obligation to put forth anything specifically about the United States, the reception of any work presented in this context is inevitably overdetermined by this national representative function. The U.S. pavilion is necessarily marked by some minimal assertion of Americanness of the work presented therein, and thus connected in some way to what Benedict Anderson famously called the imagined community of a nation. With this national representative baggage, the U.S. pavilion and its counterparts in Venice appear as something of an anachronism from the vantage point of the contemporary artistic field, which is, as we know, becoming increasingly globalized in its economic, geographic, institutional, and discursive terms rendering the idea even suspect that one would assess the practice of an artist in terms of his or her nationality. Certainly, artists, it is still possible to interact with nation-based institutions and take up nationalistic ideology, ideologies as materials for their investigations, but it is difficult to imagine representing any nation state, let alone the United States of America. Our decision was to approach the pavilion and its historical mandate of national representation in both physical and discursive terms, staging a series of challenges to the way it represents and addresses its national basis to both its own people and to the rest of the world. While fully aware of the arguments pertaining to institutional critique, as came up today, and its end games, we did feel the discourse of site specificity and displacement could provide a very productive model in thinking through these problems of place and representation. The idea that from its inception, site specificity was never simply about the fixity of place. Rather, questions of mobility, traversal, and circulation are essential and that those concerning the historical and social marking of even the most apparently remote or natural sites or environments. In other words, site specificity was always a matter of the relation between locations, between a site and its representational trace, be it in a photograph or a film, and so on. In both its physical installation and internal operations then, half mass, full mass is a translocational video. In particular, it constructs an adjacency between the mandate of the biennial, representing, in the words of the State Department, the excellence, vitality, and diversity of arts in the United States, and our long-term research concerning the transitional geography of the island of Vieques. By highlighting Vieques in our contribution to the biennial, we wish to further complicate and destabilize the take-it-for-granted status of US representation. Though subject to US law and possessing citizenship, Residents of Puerto Rico, nonetheless, have an ambivalent political relationship to the United States. Lacking statehood, legislation, legislative representation in Congress, and the right of its residents to vote for president, Puerto Rico is a kind of second-class supplement to the United States, an additional member that does not quite belong, but plays and has played a, cons a, a constitutive economic and geopolitical role for the United States for over a century. The island of Vieques is by turn on the margins of an, already, of an already marginalized territory. 
If the selection of Guillermo myself was, among other things, an affirmation of the diversity of the United States, then our intervention into the US Pavilion attempted to push that gesture of national inclusion to its limit by drawing attention to a doubly marginalized site that suffers from the environmental fallout of that nation's worldwide military industrial complex. In half mass, full mass, the performer's body allows a kind of inscripti an inscriptive or drawing process to take place, whereby the landscape is provisionally stricken through by the line created by the precariously outstretched body. The landscape is canceled out while remaining visible. This leaves a trace, a mnemonic trace, after it has disappeared from the scene, calling the self-evidence of the site itself into question. For most viewers of the video in the context of the US Pavilion, or even here today, I would say, the locational identity of the sites depicted are far from self-evident. As the 19 partitions of the video come to pass, one sees a number of architectural structures in various states of evacuation, ruin, and decrepitude. No overt explanation is provided as to what we, as a national or international public of spectators, are looking at. It remains cryptic in its anonymity for the untrained eye and resolutely silent. Half mass, full mass was thus, in a certain way, addressed to the audience that was structurally and geopolitically absent from Venice as a site of spectatorship. To the residents of the island of Vieques, of which is a population of around 10,000 people, Almost every frame in half mass, full mass presents a recognizable site of political and ecological conflict. Architectural ruins pertaining to the military occupation, the civil disobedience movement, and the various development initiatives appear throughout, often coupled with apparently untouched natural settings that always, in fact, bear the invisible traces of violence. But in each case, the site in question has also been marked with this framing device of the pole in turn used as a propping device for the performers. The appearance and subsequent disappearance of the body relative to the sites gives the process a mnemonic dimension that speaks to the politics of remembrance and obliteration embedded in the Vicenze landscape. The body pole assemblage in this film functions to reframe and performatively rewrite sites across the island, variously in terms of raising as a celebratory gesture and lowering as an indicator of mourning or distress. Over the course of the video, any simple separation between half and full is impossible to secure. When the body is raised in the top frame of a given partition, it lends the overall composition a sense of raising. When in the, is undertaken in the bottom frame, the composition reads as lowered. The difficulty in determining any clear-cut meaning for these apparent semiotic cues is meant to suggest an uneven or faltering temporality of progress in the post-military reconstruction of the island. <coughs> <laughs> Though the compositional weave of horizontal and vertical axes in each frame, uh, further exacerbated by the raising and lowering of the performer's bodies, any stable figure ground relationship that would secure the viewer's relationship to the sites in question is complicated. Instead, a, an absent counter public is conjured by these sites. And by that, I'm referring to the, the, the notion by Michael Warner that Carolyn Jones also mentioned earlier today. Instead, the people of Vieques, and it is the people of Vieques and their capacity to read the landscape in terms of the often invisible histories inscribed therein. Spaces and objects appear that appear as merely empty or incidental environmental backdrops to the minimal activity of the performer are in all cases highly charged locations. I don't have time to go into any detail really about what those locations are, with the exception of this uh, scene, which I'm glad is actually up right now, which is why I'll end this uh, brief talk is the only partition in half mass, full mass to feature the people, to feature other people besides the performers. And it's the one in which a placement is um, put up in the uh, micro business incubator of, of the, um, the town of Isabel Segundo. It's a training center and um, micro, as they call it, a micro business in incubator and training center, which appears in the upper frame over a landscape view marked in the distance by a military ruin. A flag is raised as a female professor lectures to students at work at their computer stations in a classroom decorated with photographs of the island. As it is staged in the upper frame of the partition, the performer's act makes an overall composition into a full mast, a salute to the efforts of the training center and the young people in whose potentiality it is investing. 
appearing at the end of the video, this is the soul populated partition, and it brings out the metaphorical valence of the bodily performance in terms of biopolitical training. <laughs> In order to develop their impressive capacity for endurance and concentration, the performers of this film have underground athletic training, a theme which we explored in other works for the US Pavilion in order to highlight the historical resonance between the biennial and the modern Olympic Games. At an institutional and geographic remove from both the Olympics and the biennial, Vieques was a site of, for sharpening of a different set of national skills the training of soldiers to use large-scale technologies of ballistic destruction. With the military now eva evacuated, what type of new training or perhaps counter-training is necessary for the population of Vieques, which continues to suffer from the aftermath of the military exercises undertaken there for half a century? The simultaneous endurance and, redis and resistance displayed by the performers offers a poetic, metaphoric, and ultimately a political response. Their bodies become the horizons from which are enacted new right, rights claims by those who are marginalized and excluded from the current laws, policies, and institutions governing the future development of Vieques. Thank you. You're still awake. Everyone is lively. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Azrak Shami. I'm assistant professor here in the ACT program, and I'm also alumna of the school. Um, also, I have been um, graduate affiliate at the CAVS, so I've been through all the stages of uh, different types of uh, artistic productions in this um, school, and it's really great privilege to return uh, and, and uh, in honor of our um, dear Anthony Muntadas and the, the um, case study for a network. Mm -hmm. um, and I would like to express my deepest gratitude for you, uh, for everything that you have done for this program and also for bringing all of these amazing people here. And also thank you, Gedeminas, for pulling this off. It wouldn't have been possible without Nomeda and an amazing team also of ACT, so <coughs> you guys rocked it. So, I prepared a visual uh, reflection on our panel, as I'm also practicing as an artist. Uh, the last panel of this conference, as we've seen, uh, brings together the alumni of this program, uh, now a group of fantastic young professionals who are working across the fields of art, architecture, and their history and theory. And um, what I wanted to do with my response is to somehow make um, relevant these things that they have brought up and also some of the uh, themes that we heard today to this very place, Cambridge, MIT, and our own uh, work. Um, consider Muntadas' project, Media Eyes, from 1981. It was installed on the billboard above um, Cambridge Port Saloon, which is close to MIT between Kendall Square and Central Square. Much has changed in Cambridge ever since. If you look at the same site today, um, instead of the Cambridge Saloon and its surrounding buildings, everything has been bulldozed, it is gone, it is now a large construction site. Many similar places have been erased in Cambridge to make space for corporate giants uh, such as Novartis or Pfizer. The areas between Central Square and Kendall Square are developing rapidly with investments from biotechnology and pharmaceutical industries. Uh, so anyone who knows the, uh, more about the history of this place will be wondering that cafe latte is now sold in places in Kendall Square that have been empty for most of the last 40 years. Many of the independent art initiatives, such as the Arts Interactive, have left um, um, or have closed um, the central square, but now new creative industries have moved in, such as the work bar here in Cambridge um, and a center for co-working. 
changes have happened and are still happening in Cambridge, and MIT is um, an active agent in the, in the, in the process of change. Uh, and it has a stake in the way corporate real estate boom will affect public space in Cambridge. Will low-income residents and ethnic minorities be replaced with higher-income population? I, too, am affected by uh, participating and making it happen every time I buy my grande uh, sugar-free non-fat uh, latte. I, too, was also affected uh, one year ago when half of the city of Boston and Cambridge was shut down completely following the marathon bombings. It is within this both local and global discussion about the effects of unequal distribution of wealth and cultural and social um, diversity in cities, as well as corporate governance and surveillance of public space, that our four <coughs> panelists bring their creative and critical insights into the ways in which we and larger systems of power interact and uh, enforce one another. As public space is never stable, it needs to be constantly renegotiated, and our panelists prompt us to think about the notion of justice and access to these negotiations of public space. Who is included and who is excluded? We are very privileged to be in a position to ask this question in this very place in the penthouse of MIT. Much has been said in the past two days about the forces and technologies that undermine public space about implications of its loss. So I would like the, to ask the question, what can we actually do? Um, and from their own field of research and practice, our panelists all speak to the questions of what can we artists, architects, academics, educators do? Do we have an agency? So I would like to make uh, three propositions. First, the artist, architect, has an agency. An agent, according to the anthropologist Alfred Gell, is someone who, quote, causes things to happen in their vicinity, who has the capacity to initiate causal effects that can be ascribed to the artistic intention. Agency, according to Gell, is culturally prescribed framework for thinking about causation. An event happens because it was launched through a person or a thing that initiate um, a causal sequence. Matthew in Acts, um, his agency by enabling interaction and initiating a process of discovery about what is missing in the community, which then led to the creation of the public living room, a space for uh, the public to assemble itself. Um, I find very strong in his work uh, the, the modesty and elegance with which Ma Matthew avoids the pitfall of social practice that could have utilized the artist uh, as a problem solver in service of community, while still generating a process of social change that continues uh, to evolve long after the artist has left the town. So it is not just the intention that the artist brings in, but also the action continues and is actually happening. Corin enacts his agency by providing an alternative to the phenomenological approach in the conception of museums and rethinking the ways in which the experience of the audience can be linked to the artifacts that are exhibited, especially under consideration that not everyone can afford a ticket. In a situation of budgetary cuts and political pressures, many museums today are using marketing <coughs> techniques to um, um, attract more vi visitors, redirecting the focus of the attention towards um, uh, the, the visitors rather to their collections. What happens when enjoyment and consumption become the primary goal for visiting these institutions, taking over the educational agenda of the museum? To what extent can these um, hedonistic experiences be justified in the museum? To what um, shall museums be treated as cultural temples or theme parks? Where do we draw the line? Corin works, um, Corin's work offers a refreshing um, critique of the commodification of the museum's experience while supporting the value of public uh, cultural institutions uh, for education and preservation. 
My second point is that uh, not only um, humans are agents, but also non-human things such as uh, artifacts of art and architecture can have agency. The meaning that people attribute to things derives from the ways these things enter culture and the ways they are used uh, and circulated. Non-human things, such as objects of art and architecture, can appear as agents in particular <coughs> social situations, um, and we understand uh, them as such when they manage to transfer the sense of inten intentionality from the artist um, to the object. The work of Jennifer and Giuliano has the agency in the way that uh, it functions as a lens for investigations and a critical mirror creating the perspective on a problem and changing our perspective on it, um, revealing the limits of free speech in democratic context so that demands can be vocalized. The agency in their work is also about facilitating visibility of what is contested and purposefully forgotten by the winners of history. And their work captures and recovers that memory. Their art has an agency in the way it performs on the human scale, filtering things through absurdity um, to expose how training and constraining uh, our bodies feeds the construction of the larger body of the nation. And finally, my third point um, regards the education. Education has agency. The kind of research that Marika is conducting is important because we need to first understand the context and the history of the place in order to be able to create a response um, to its problem. Um, and to understand the history is to understand oneself. To write history is a political act. How are we to uh, combat future wars of a voter if we are um, not understanding where they have failed in the past? If you were able to see the wonderful uh, exhibition downstairs featuring the work of Montadas' students produced in these exciting studios that traveled all across the world, uh, from Las Vegas to Beijing and engaging students in discussions with local artists uh, and communities with real people in real places. Teaching, as we learn from Montadas, is an act of generosity. And um, for, for Montadas, pedagogy really went beyond the classroom and engaged uh, a broad range of, of people uh, also beyond academia. Um, alumnus Jigan Vincent de Paul reports about his experience in Montadas' public art class. I quote, what I appreciated the most about his teaching of public art was the international nature. Many of his students over years had the opportunity to travel to faraway places and come back with wholly new perspectives. I think um, uh, art is about certain kind of criticality, sensibility, which Montada strongly fostered on all of us." End quote. Teaching is also about uh, inspiration and respect, and as we learn this from his students, the ability to bring the best in, uh, that one has not f completely formulated in, uh, in the mind, but to say in Matthew's words, um, quote, as a professor, he honestly create, cared about making his students develop what they found interesting in a more meaningful way. There is so much we need to be grateful to Montadas for uh, everything what he contributed to this institution and what he gave to the generation of young brilliant minds that uh, graduated from it. The kind of experimental pedagogy that connects his research practice and critical feedback is crucial in retaining uh, integrity in academia and resisting the pressures to constantly produce without actually having time to think about that delivery. When I first came to uh, MIT, uh, I was, and actually I came to Princeton for my master's studies, I was uh, on the one hand really uh, enthusiastic about the way uh, I, I was encouraged and inspired by my educators, but at the same time I was really terrified by the fact that I had to meet my studio professor every second day. And, uh, and to show them what I have produced in the meantime while I had all these other classes. So this constant pressure to deliver is something I think we really need to th um, rethink in, in our education. And even if I might be biting the hand that feeds me here, um, 
I, I have to say that we need to slow down and allow more time and, and space for students to think, and this is something that really Montadas has uh, generally offered in his classes. He would, uh, as well as he was, um, uh, treat the context in which he worked with sensitivity also uh, in the same way he treated his students, reacting flexibly to the class um, because every class is different. <coughs> But how are we to resist the dilemma that if we loosen the pressure on the student, uh, that then they will um, not do any work in our class because everyone else is putting pressure on them to do work for their classes. Here again, we can learn from Montadas' irresistible charm and <laughs> paradoxically firm yet relaxed sense of leadership. It is the joy, the enthusiasm, and humor that he transfers to his students, um, and after which they make time for thinking and making art because they discover how is it important and why sh do, should they care. I would like to conclude this homage to Montadas with the photo montage that I made uh, of media eyes in Dafen, China village uh, with painters who are mass producing paintings. And by throwing a question back on you, what is it that we are looking at today? Where is art, culture, technology produced? Thank you. Water as well, or? Mm. I think. Do you have one? Uh -huh. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there is a little red book here, several souvenirs uh, <laughs> on the table. We are all exhausted, uh, so I would try to, to be. Um, eh? yeah. To be brief, um, I'm, I'm really, really happy to be here uh, in this conference celebrating uh, Montadas and his uh, work on uh, a public space, and uh, particularly um, his teaching. It's really an extraordinary event full of uh, uh, old friends and new friends and, uh, and, and so many uh, so former students and so many um, people that we have, uh, friends that we have in common. But I know Montadas from a long time, I mean, from the early 80s, actually. He was very close to the advisor of my dissertation, to Ignacio Solar Morales. In fact, they went to school together, no? to elementary uh, school uh, together, and that's how I first um, met uh, uh, Montadas. And from the beginning, there was this incredible kind of resonance between what you were doing and what I was doing in terms of uh, uh, space and media, and we have always been engaged in these uh, conversations, um, usually coming from a country and living into another, like Montadas will live us. I just came from Brazil, but I'm leaving tomorrow, and you know, and we will have a coffee and we talk about uh, what we are thinking, and I think he does that with so many other people, that as was uh, uh, say before uh, here, um, uh, Montadas is like a great networker, right? I mean, this, all this network of young people, of, you know, of all generations that he touches base, base with, that he engages, and I think this is uh, really a form of public space, as well an enormous generosity. I was in Brazil, and I saw this, and you saw that, and the other thing, and it's very brief, and, and may take because nobody has that much time. Sometimes just a conversation on the phone, or maybe we go for a coffee, and sometimes we have uh, dinner, and it's longer. But the important thing is not how long it is, but how many of those uh, uh, touching base take place with, uh, with uh, uh, Montadas, which I think is all precisely uh, related to this fascination that he has with, uh, with public space and the space of... Uh, of discussion, right? Um, so when Montas and I start talking about this event, it, it, it happened like that. He called to say, okay, I, I know you are coming from Bilbao. How was Bilbao, blah, blah, blah. And before we know, we are into, into this question of this uh, 
of, of, of what I was thinking right now, and very quickly what uh, I have been assigned to do here, which is to um, to perhaps be a respondent or, or I don't know what, but I'm not a very I'm not a very good uh, respondent or a moderator, but I'm not a moderate person either. So <laughs> it quickly it quickly uh, developed into just do whatever you are thinking uh, right now. And I uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. And also I think it's a, a way for me to respond to your questions here and also to to the work that has been presented um, uh, here um, today and even in this uh, very panel. In my view, the most uh, significant thing that has uh, happened to public space in the last decade has been precisely uh, the appearance of uh, or the arrival of, uh, of social uh, media. Uh, it may be worth to, to remember that there was no such a thing as social media uh, in, the, uh, in the 20th century. Right. So uh, it was already 2000, I mean July uh, of 2000, when a French reuni reunited site uh, was launched in Great Britain and to locate all school friends. And between, uh, uh, by the end of the year, they have 3,000 uh, users, right? So a lot, but not a lot, really. The next year, 2.5 million. So is that the first uh, social network was uh, established, followed by Friendster in 2002 with three million people in three months. 2003 was MySpace. 2004, of course, Facebook, this is a very uh, well-known story, it started at Harvard and was understood, we now forget that, as a college version of Friendster. Uh, in a month, half of uh, uh, the Harvard College population was on Facebook. It then expanded to other colleges, and in 2005, it opened to high school students. I remember that moment distinctively, looking over my daughter's computer. What, what are you doing? <laughs> right? So it was so incredibly um, surprising. 2006 was uh, Twitter, and of course, uh, also the year that Facebook uh, open uh, to anyone over uh, 13. There are now 1 billion point four users of uh, of uh, of Facebook. I mean, in fact, there is this map that is completely out of date. It's from uh, 2010, and they, at that point, there were only 700 um, users. Uh, and of course, so on and on. Facebook may be very well on his uh, uh, way down. And there has been, in the meantime, an exponential acceleration of the number of channels and the number of people using them. It, it's estimated uh, that next year, uh, 4 billion people, which is 60% of the world population, will be connected to the internet, and, and mostly through, through um, uh, their mobile uh, devices, so therefore, uh, which is, by the way, how social networks also. This, of course, represents a total transformation of the way uh, we live, which has huge implications for architecture. Indeed, I think of it in terms of... Uh, of architecture. And this, I think, is an urgent uh, question today. We need to understand the way we live. Um, but how to start to investigate this massive architectural event? Uh, the first thing, then, perhaps, to realize is how architectural it is. Already in 1999, uh, and maybe architects and architectural theories are the last to realize how architectural it is. Everybody else seems to have no problem seeing this as an architectural question. In 1999, for example, an article in the New York Times reported that one quarter of a million people were exposing their lives online. That was a scandal, right? And that one million uh, webcams had been sold that year. This was thought to be uh, shocking. Uh, numbers, one million exposing themselves, but now billions uh, are regularly exposing uh, themselves um, <coughs> online. So, um, this, as I said before, uh, represents a completely uh, new situation. The screens that, that Montada has worked with so uh, and written about so eloquently keep getting closer and closer to our, our bodies. They have become in, indeed even part of our bodies. Equipped with our uh, mobile technologies, uh, we filter the world through through them. We navigate the, the city with the help of uh, all these Google Maps or whatever. We monitor, monitor traffic on the highway and take alternative routes on the basis of information coming from our phones. We are bombarded with information from our friends who send pictures of their kids or their cats and tweets and retweets and report information, making or passing news rather than receiving 
uh, news. So everybody, in a way, has become now a curator of stories and images, and that, I think, is a significant uh, transfer transformation, a whole new generation, the generation of my daughter will tell you that they don't read the newspapers anymore. It's not just that they read them digitally, that's what we do. We read them digitally. They rely on social media to alert them to any new of any significance, and then maybe they dig up into. So what is the consequence of this state of affairs uh, for the city? What is private and what is public? What is urban and what is domestic? What is inside and what is outside? What is night? And what is they? Let's ask the simplest architectural questions. Where is all of this uh, happening? What is the space of social media? An Australian survey last year found that 34% of social network users log on at work. Right, normal, you know, you're bored, you log on. Okay, 13% on the school, also normal, right? 18% in their cars. Okay, this is getting a bit dangerous, but never mind. 44% in bed. Uh, 7% in the bathroom, 6% in the toilet. <laughs> okay, you know what I found so fascinating about the statistics? It's not the 44% in the bed, I actually find that uh, normal. It's where did the house go? So when, you know, you know how, when you start reading and you anticipate the next line, I read 34% uh, log on at work, and I thought to myself, oh yeah, of course, and 60% will be doing it at home. But no, there is no home. There is no living room. There is not even bedroom. There is only bed. Yeah? There is car and there is toilet, but they don't tell you where this toilet is. For all, everything I know, it could, it could be in the highway. You know, it could be a gas station in the highway. So all we have is this bed floating alone with no bedroom, no house, just uh, the bed. So the bed has become really the epicenter of this universe, which um, is uh, somehow uh, uh, consistent with something that I read also uh, last year in the Wall Street Journal, and now this is probably a very conservative estimate that say in 2012, the Wall Street Journal, that 80%, 80% of young New York City professionals were regularly uh, from bed. Okay, so who knows how many are doing it now. So the, the office has really moved into the bed. Millions <laughs> of dispersed beds are taking over from concentrated office towers, right? The boudoir, in a way, is defeating uh, the tower. And <laughs> you wrote a beautiful book on the office tower, so there you go. Network electronic uh, technologies have removed any limit to what can be done uh, in bed. But how did we get uh, uh, um, here? In his uh, famous essay, Louis Filippo, the, Inter or the Interior, you know this beautiful essay of Walter Benjamin, so I wouldn't bother you with it, but he talks precisely about this splitting between uh, work and home in the 19th century when he says under Louis Philippe, the private citizen enters the state of history. For the private person, living space becomes for the first time antithetical to the place of work. The form is constituted by the interior, the offices is complement, etc., and etc. Industrialization, of course, brought with it the eight-hour shift and the radical separation between home and office, factory, uh, uh, etc. So between rest and work, between night and day, there was these clear separations at that point. It's not clear that it was there be before. You know, you know all these stories about how people will wake up in the middle of the night and do all these things, and they, nobody slept eight hours. This is uh, very interesting to find out today with all this new research that this thing of the eight hours is a complete invention. No? In the medieval times, before there was electricity, people didn't do that at all. They would sleep four hours and then get up and, and have sex and eat and whatever and work, uh, whatever they were doing. And then they would go back and sleep some more later, you know? So it was not that way. So post-industrialization, on the other hand, is collapsing work back into the home and takes it further into the bedroom and um, into the bed itself. Phantasmagoria is no longer lying in the room in the wallpaper, fabric, images, and objects, as Benjamin will talk, is now in the electronic devices. The whole universe is concentrated on this small screen with the bed uh, floating in an infinite sea of information. Mm -hmm. To lie down is not to rest, but to move precisely. The bed is now a site of action, but this voluntary uh, invalid has no need of their legs. Eh? The bed has become like the ultimate prosthetic uh, um, device and a whole uh, new industry 
is dedicated to providing contraptions to facilitate world war uh, uh, working in bed because it's, of course it's not easy, right? So you have to have to all these things so that your chiropractor uh, is actually fully employed right now. You you uh, do all these things like reading, writing, testing, recording, broadcasting, listening, talking, and of course eating, drinking, drinking, sleeping, or making love activities which seem to have been turned of late into work itself. You know what I'm talking about, no? When you go to a restaurant and somebody says, are you still working on that? You're like, working on this? Okay. Or when, for example, there's all this advice about working on your relationships and how you should work on your relationships and schedule uh, 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 sex. So, or, or not to mention uh, how sleep has become also for millions of people some form of work with all these uh, therapies giving you advice and instructions and a whole pharmacology industry producing new pills uh, every year to somehow attain this apparently ever more elusive uh, goal, everything has become, uh, in a way, everything done in, in, in bed has become, in a way, a kind of work. This uh, philosophy was already uh, embodied in the fi figure of Hugh Hefner, um, who famously almost never left uh, his bed, let alone his house. He literally moved his office into his bed in 1960 when he moved into the Playboy Mansion in Chicago, turning into to the epicenter of a global empire and his silk pajamas and dressing gown into his business attire. I don't go out of the house at all. I am a contemporary recluse, he told Tom Wolf, guessing that the last time he had been out of the house has been three and a half months before, and that in the last two years, he had been out of the house only uh, nine times. Fascinated, Tom Wars described him as the tender timpani green heart of an artichoke. So <laughs> here is Tom uh, Wars. And of course, when Hefner went out, he was not really out, but wrapped in a succession of bubbles that were all designed to extend his interior. And this include all the specially outfitted vehicles the Big Bunny is the most interesting one, perhaps, which is a stretch uh, DC-9 designed by Ron Dismiss, the same architect of the mansion, with a gourmet uh, kitchen, a dancing floor, a living room conference space, discotheque, wet bar, state-of-the-art in of projectors, a sleeping quarters for 16 guests, and Hefner's suite with a shower and an elliptical bed covering Tasmanian opossum skins. This is... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the bed of Hefner when he's flying and here he's arriving in London with his then uh, girlfriend uh, uh, Barbie um, and you can see that he's a bit uh, kind of tense, right? And she's totally kind of relaxed and in her, uh, and in her element. Like if he's saying like, he's, this is not my bed really, but you know, <laughs> never mind. And, and, and if he moves, uh, but it's his bed, except it's not his regular, uh, what do you mean one minute? He told me I had 20 minutes. What? <laughs> You have 10, but you should have said before. I already started talking. You say, he said 20. Well, anyway, don't argue. <laughs> you guys have, should have told me before. <laughs> OK, don't worry. I'll finish soon. Um, so he moves from, uh, from the bed to these vehicles to other uh, interiors. So it's a continuous interior from the bed to the, to the houses, to the clubs, of course. Uh, which he built all over uh, the wall. And this is actually Hefner himself that photographed himself as an architect with the model of the, of the Playboy Hotel in, uh, in Los Angeles and the pie pointing to it. It's actually what Le Corbusier uh, will have done. In any case, Playboy turns the bed into a workplace. From the uh, mid-50s on, the bed becomes increasingly sophisticated, outfitted with all sorts of entertainment and communication devices as a kind of control room. The magazine devoted many articles to the design of the perfect bed. Hefner acted as the model with his famous round bed in, play, in the Playboy um, Mansion in Chicago. The, first, the bed was first uh, introduced as a feature in the Playboy, uh, here he is, in his bed in the mansion, working. And the bed was first introduced in this um, Playboy townhouse 
which is a house that was designed for him and featured in the magazine in 1962, which presents this detailed, unrealized project with plans, sections, and renderings uh, uh, commissioned, as I said, to be his house. And it's in this context that for the first time appears this round uh, bed. The house in the end is not realized because it didn't pass the landmark commission uh, in Chicago. It was in a fancy neighborhood, and they didn't want this guy over there, I suppose. But the bed itself is realized uh, in the mansion. The bed, you could argue, is itself a house. It's rotating, vibrating a structure is packed with, listen to this, a small fridge, hi-fi, hi -fi, telephone, filing cabinets, bar, microphone, dictaphone, video cameras, headphones, TV, breakfast tables, war tables, and control for all the light fixtures in the house for the man who never wants to leave. The bed was Hefner's office, his place of business, where he conducted interview, made phone calls, selected images, adjusted layout, edited test, ate, drank, and <coughs> consulted with <laughs> playmates. <laughs> we, we have no evidence that he ever had any sex there, you know? I mean, there is a lot of evidence of work, but there is zero evidence that anything uh, actually happened other than, than performance. Anyway, Hefner by the way, was not alone. The bed became the ultimate American office at mid-century. In an interview in the Paris Review, for example, Truman Capote say, uh, he's asked, what are your writing habits? You, do you use a desk? Do you write on a machine? To which he answers, I'm a completely horizontal author. I can't think unless I'm lying down, eh, eh, down uh, either in bed or whatever, one with a cigarette and a coffee uh, handy. No, I don't use a typewriter. Not in the beginning. I write my first version in longhand and then he proceeds to, 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 to type it, but he's still not getting out of bed. No, I don't get out of the bed to do this, to type. I balance the machine on my knees. Sure, it works fine. I can manage 100 words uh, a minute, right? So even architects, more surprising, uh, set up office in bed at mid-century. Richard Neutra uh, started to work, apparently, the moment he woke up with elaborate equipment that enabled him to write, design, or even interview in bed. This is the BDL house, and uh, there are plenty of uh, occasions in the house to lie down outside, etc. But no, apparently he didn't move from bed. Uh, this is his son now writing. That uh, time for, uh, best time for creative thinking was early in the morning, long before any activity had started in the office before. He often stayed in bed working with his ideas and designs, even extending into appointments which had be ma been made earlier. His one concession to convention was to put on a tie, over his night shirt when receiving visitors were still prop up in bed. So he would put a tie over his pyjamas without even changing. Neutra's bed in the BDL house uh, in Los Angeles included, listen to this, it sounds like a Hugh Hefner bed, included two public phones, three communication stations to talk to other rooms in the house, the office below, and even another office that was 500 meters away. So it's crossing now, these cables are crossing um, uh, the street, three different call bells, drafting boards and users that folded down over the bed, electric lights and a radio gramophone controlled from a dashboard overhead, a bedside a table rolling on casters held, the tape recorder, electric clock, and a storage compartment for drawing and writing equi equipment so that he could, and this is all from a neutral uh, letter that he wrote to his si sister, he says, so that he could use every minute from morning to late at night. So, um, Post-war uh, America, in a way, inaugurated the high-performance bed as the epicenter of productivity, a new form of industrialization which was exported globally and had now become available to an international army of dispersed by interconnected producers. A new kind of factory without walls is constructed by compact electronics and extra pillows for the 24-7 uh, generation. We are indeed living in a 24-7 culture, as Jonathan Crary has recently argued in this beautiful little book, 24-7 uh, Capitalism and the End of a Sleep. It's really a uh, very nice uh, uh, book, very in in intelligent uh, and, and uh, very thought-provoking. Thought but uh, I hesitate about the cover. Of course, a beautiful cover, right? But what is this? It's an, off it's an image of an office uh, at night, which is, in, in fact, an old idea. Right in the sense of the uh, the classic events of the office building with the lights all the night, but the city that never sleeps, etc. But in fact, this is an old reality. Now we have all, in a way, moved into the bed. 
the kind of uh, equipment uh, that Hefner envisioned, some of which didn't even exist, he invented in a way the answering machine, is now expanded for the internet and social media generation who not only work in bed, but socialize in bed, exercise in bed, read the news in bed, and entertain sexual relationships with people miles away from their, their bed. After all, the fantasy of the nice girl next door is much more likely realized today with someone in another continent than in the same building. A person you may never have seen before and we perhaps never seen again, and it's anybody guess, anybody's guess if it is real, that is if it's he or he exists in some place uh, and time, or is an electronic construction. The, uh, as in the recent film, uh, Her, which is of course a moving uh, depiction of life in the soft uterine state that is a color rally to our new mobile technologies, Her is actually an operating system that turns out to be more satisfying partner than a person. Uh, the protagonist lies in bed with her, uh, uh, chatting, uh, arguing, uh, making love, uh, and eventually even breaking uh, up. If according to Jonathan Clary, capitalism is the end of sleep, colonizing every minute of our lives for production and consumption, then the actions of this uh, voluntary recluse uh, are not so voluntary uh, in the end. A sleep itself has become part of the industrial process. In today's attention deficit disorder, we have discovered that we work better in short bursts uh, punctuated by rest. Today, many companies provide the sleeping pods in the office so to maximize uh, productivity. Bed and office are never far apart in this 24-7 world. This is the nap master, right? Uh, <laughs> which they have now in many, in many uh, co companies. So between the bed inserted in the office and the office inserted in the bed, a whole new horizontal architecture has taken over. It is magni magnified by the flat networks of social media that have themselves been fully integrated into the professional business and industrial environment in a collapse of traditional distinctions between private and public work and play rest and action. The bed itself, with its ever more complicated and sophisticated mattress, linings and technical uh, uh, attachments, is the basis of an intra-uterine environment that combines the sense of deep interiority with the sense of hyper-connectivity to the outside. The bed today has become also a portable universe equipped with every possible technology of communication. In that sense, a mid-century fantasy has turned into a re in reality. So we may ask ourselves, what is the architecture of this new space and time? In the 1960s and 70s, experimental architects devoted a lot of time to the equipment of the new mobile nomads in a whole galaxy of portable interiors with soft reclining spaces as the core of a complex uh, of prosthetic extensions. Uh, you can think about uh, Warren Chop, the Bathematic, or uh, the suite alone of microwave and all these other uh, uh, projects. A kind of, um, all these projects can be understood as high performance, but with complete with media, artificial atmospheres, color, uh, light, smell, a kind of pop, uh, uh, Melnikov with the workers uh, sleeping in the control booth. Rainer Bonham wrote about uh, a naked uh, Fonda flying through the space in her far uh, line horizontal bub bubble in the same breath that he enthusiastically embraced the architecture of Playboy. It was just a matter of time before John Lennon and Yoko Ono held a week-long bed in peace in the Amsterdam Hilton uh, Hotel during the honeymoon on March 1969. The idea of the bed in, of course, comes from the sit-in protest and was intended as a non-violent protest against war and to promote uh, world peace. Make love, not war, was of course the slogan of the day. But to the disappointment of all the journalists that came over there, John and Joko were fully dressed in their pyjamas, sitting in bed, as John put it, like angels. <laughs> the bed, uh, in a way, at that point, has already taken over from the street as the site of protest. They invited the world press into their room every day between 9 uh, a.m. and 9 p.m., like an office, right? Treating the bed exactly as an office in which they work, where journalists stream in and images stream out. So in conclusion, we may want to ask what is the nature of this new interior 
in which we have decided uh, collectively to check ourselves in. What is the architecture of this prison in which night and day work and play are no longer differentiated and we are permanently under surveillance, even as we sleep in the control booth? New media turns all of us into inmates constantly under surveillance, even as we celebrate endless connectivity. We have all become contemporary recluses, as Hefner put it a half a century ago. Thank, thank you very much. In respect of time, we'll uh, conclude with this beautiful message, make love instead of war. And I would like to invite Nader Tehrani, head of the architecture department of MIT, to um, conclude this great um, symposium. And then we can go and drink uh, gin tonic with Montadas. This is the only drink that's going to be there. I think it's, <laughs> this is his favorite. Uh, he outside and then we go for dinner. Okay, Nader, please. Uh, you know, I really fear to, to, to read anything for you because I, I, I somehow think that um, uh, you've ended the evening quite well. But out of a kind of duty to, to decorum, uh, I'll read you five minutes of, of, of my notes and uh, try to bring uh, all of this to a kind of closure. Um, after two days of exceptional presentations and discussions, I want to thank you all for your contributions. This has been a an amazing occasion. True to the composition of classical symposia, this event is being arranged around a framing of institutional authority with its launching with Dean Adal Santos and now being closed out by me as the head of the department for a few more days. Uh, as it were, trying to package the event in a neat and tidy way. Uh, and certainly I'll do my best to bring this to a symbolic closure uh, of apt diplomatic decorum, but I will not attempt to restate the themes that have been better presented by the various protagonists of each panel. I think if there's anything of the, at, that the various panels of this conference bring to mind, it is the subversive way in which things cannot easily fit within our received baggage of disciplinary conventions. And certainly MIT and its School of Architecture are not organized to reinforce the idea of centrality. Quite the opposite, composed of five discipline groups, numerous centers and labs, we are dispersed horizontally with our own boundaries constantly being shifted and rearranged according to projects, speculations and challenges to the institution. Remember that the very birth of the Media Lab and ACT themselves being the result of renegade practices that defied any traditional definition of the architectural discipline. In that context, I'm a kind of dinosaur. Just two nights ago, we came together around a discussion about engaged autonomy with Sarah Whiting as our guest speaker. And, um, advocating not only for a strategic engagement with the world of politics, planning, and social action, but underlining the agency of architecture, that uh, architecture must somehow seek to enforce its own media, ostensibly rooted in the spatial, formal, and material strategies that catalyze a broader dialogue with the city, society, and a sense of the public. <coughs> and certainly, as a dedicated designer, I would not want to debate that in itself, but if the presentations of the last two days have shown us anything, it is the overwhelming insufficiency of the classical architectural repertoire of techniques. In fact, I come out of this occasion not so much feeling like the head of the department, but rather a kind of field soldier in the trenches somewhere. The expanded arena within which design agency is being described, um, the expanded arena within which design ag agency is being described would suggest that the architectural discipline is in fact a supplement to the larger enterprise of invoking a public realm. In turn, somehow our received techniques, whether spatial or organizational, material or geometric, are merely a fragment of the ever-expanding domain that is constantly being redefined by technology, media, or equally importantly, the deliberate agency of artists, architects, and activists that are challenging the very notion of closure within disciplines. 
Until today, I kept thinking how odd it is to have ACT so far away from the architectural headquarters on the other side of the campus where the other four disciplines are located. In effect, trying to think of ways of bridging them back under our, bringing them back under our larger banner. But in the context of this discussion, it is exactly the opposite that is evidence. How ironic to have an architectural headquarters so far away from the media headquarters, which is the spatial, technological, which is the headquarters within which the spatial, techn technological, and social practices are played out in the world today, at least anything of relevance. Well, that's another battle, and I'll leave it to the next head to negotiate the real estate wars that may reinforce the possibility of aligning our own spatial practices with those that define our technological en engagement with each other. What might be at stake, though, is the way in which we leverage our ability to redefine architectural pedagogy within an age where media is being redefined in a dynamic way on a daily basis, and how the representational strategies of yesterday are proving to be a pale shadow of the generative, analytical, and communicative tools that, uh, that are at our disposal in the expanded field of public engagement. And certainly technology is not only central to this, but even more importantly, it is the critical culture latent within ACT, HTC, History, Theory, and Criticism, CAST, and other elements within the Institute that have helped to foster the kind of healthy suspicion that frames both the subversive potential of media on the one hand, but also its institutional instrumentality in the face of surveillance, power, and ide ideological persuasion. The larger question looming in front of us is how to redefine architectural pedagogy in ways that keep broadening both the technical and intellectual arena within which the engagement of the public is played out. At MIT, we have seen this take on different forms and shapes, but rarely as a cohesive department or as a, or as a curriculum. Nonetheless, it is interesting the way in which our lateral flexibility, collaborative openness, and interdisciplinary infrastructure has given rise to new forms, um, new forms of architectural practice. Moreover, the larger pedagogical question beyond helping to reveal the certainties of the architectural field, what seems more important is to frame those uncertainties without which the expansion of the discipline would not be possible. As I begin preparing to step down, I'm reminded of the many ways in which ACT can catalyze certain key elements within our core curriculum to effectively reinvent our audiences. And certainly, we have the right elements in place to do that, with a strong design faculty, with a new Center for Advanced Urbanism, uh, Alexander was here today, among other technical and inte intellectual infrastructures, much is in place to enforce a more robust re-engagement. That will not happen much in my hands, but in the nimble hands of Mi Jin Yoon, who helped introduce the first panel. It is maybe no accident that there is such optimism in looking forward to her leadership. Her history of engagement, not only with uh, Muntadas, but with media in general, is no secret. Not only a sophisticated and refined architect in the classical sense, she has teased out the best of MIT for herself, not only in the pedagogical platform she has shared, but in fact in the ways that she has transformed her own research, work, and profile through technologies. Well known for her white noise and white light installation in Athens uh, that launched her career on the international stage, she continues to undertake challenging projects like the border crossing installation that is currently under construction. Alas, given the traditional and limited institutional frameworks, under, we, under which we all work, she works there as the 1% artist, not as the architect. And the building onto which the installation is placed in all prob probability will be well known in the near future, but more probably because of the very supplemental work that she's doing, which, uh, which will be a more critical index of the, of the project over the architecture. And I say this with all due respect to the architects. Mijin's Mijin weaves together the political and the everyday together to index the passage of travel across the line of the border. She bridges the aesthetics of abstraction and data building, adopting interactive actuators to record through light the passage of the public. And while doing so, she gives new meaning to the line of the border, the line of the horizon, and the line between disciplines. Our engagement with technology is, of course, part and parcel of our daily habits. We brush our teeth and then check the email. We put the car into drive and then start texting, and this despite many warnings. 
And all this has given rise to new forms of potentiality, but also social distraction and pathologies. With new technologies and new forms comes a new social decorum and etiquette. But there's little doubt that the boundaries between the public and the private keep getting challenged as a result. Consider the man sitting next to you on the airplane talking on a cell phone about the most intimate details as if you did not exist. Has public discourse been privatized? Or has the private discourse been made more public ever than before? Both modalities can be tested. Consider the reply all command in your email and how it is used indiscriminately in mass emails or inadvertently in other instances, exposing sometimes the tragic and dangerous private realm. But the dirty laundry that gets exposed in the digital realm could be argued to be a direct extension of the very spatial practices that we have, come to, uh, have become accustomed to in the urban realm. Hanging laundry in the backyard is, after all, different than on the front facade. Subverting one over the other is also a challenge to the social contract that is usually played out in the public realm. For that very reason, balancing out your limits of, uh, balancing out your limits of cell phone use on a public bus or in the cinema keeps getting redefined, and sometimes with mortal consequences, as we recently saw in Florida. All of these details of media are, are part and uh, excuse me, all of these details of media are part of the new means and methods that are at the very core of public transactions that may take place. And thus, not knowing their technical and theoretical implications is tantamount to, to closing our eyes to their agency. For this reason, I would only argue that the, the same urgency that we, uh, we, that we need to understand the protocols of construction as architects, we also need to understand the specifications of new media as we build our audiences in the public realm. More than anything, what remains open is how the techniques of one media impact that of the other or how they are reconciled, hybridized, and how they become the agent of change in our conception of art and um, design. Excuse me, sorry about that. It's a text message that's sort of intervening on, on, on this last message. It's, it can be kind of a deadly thing. What, what's worse is it's actually about this. It says, ya vas a nader, tengo hambre. Venga, vamos. <laughs> Is that, is that you or is it somebody else? <laughs> okay, l l l let me close this out. <laughs> it doesn't look like you, but I think it's you. <laughs> Yes, somebody is in. Anyway, l listen, I would like to, to thank you all personally for making this event such a success and for the generosity of your presence here amongst us to honor a, a special member of our community. More than anything, this evening is dedicated to Antoni Muntadas, who has not only been a central intellectual voice at MIT for so many years, but has inspired us through the kind of work and discourse he has unleashed outside of these walls. Muntadas, I understand that you would like to be relieved of your formal duties at MIT, and we will certainly grant you that respectfully, but, we will not, but you will not be relieved of your intellectual presence, uh, dialogue, and continued debate. In, in our mind, you will remain here for many years to come, and in any format you wish. Thank you again, Muntadas, and may we look forward to many other such occasions as this. Good night, and buen provecho. Huh? <laughs>